ch checked out the Arbor XR booth. It's one of the most important booths here. Uh, just kidding. Uh, we've got a panel and a talk, and then we're at lunch. So let's lock in for an hour and a half or so here. And I think this first panel is going to be really good. Uh, it's a question that's very uh, important, probably for all of us in different stages. But uh, we're going to hear about strategies for introducing XR in your organization uh, from a diverse group. Uh, so I'm excited to introduce Micah White as the moderator for this panel. Micah is the Senior Director of R&D at CGS. So bring it home, Mike. Hey there, good morning everybody. Can you uh, hear me good on the microphone? Yeah. Right on. So, uh, welcome. This panel is uh, strategies for introducing XR to your organization. So I think it's a very timely panel. We heard earlier today uh, at, a, at a keynote about, uh, you know, XR going from novelty to commodity in the enterprise. And I think this will be a really informative talk. I've got a really esteemed uh, panel here today. So I'm going to sit here over on the edge and we're just going to bring each person up. Um, I'd like to introduce to you this esteemed panel. So we've got Morali Nathan. He's the Director of Digital Innovation and Employee Experience at Avery Dennison. Yeah. Welcome. Good to see you again. So secondly, we've got uh, John Rigg, who's a Technology Strategist, Innovation Group, and Holland's R&D Product Owner at Qit. Thank you very much. We've got Susan Spark, who's the Learning Technology Manager at Slumberger. And then we've got Amanda Clarida, Manager, Senior Manager of Learning Design and Development at Volvo. <laughs> okay, and we've got Matt, uh, Matthew Leshko, the Training and Competence Manager at Transocean. Okay, so this is foundational and a, and a fundamental question to ask. How do we get an XR project? How do we get it introduced to an organization? So there's hardware, there's software, there's services, there's buy-in, there's mindshare, there's creative, there's ROI, there's use case, there's so many different things. So we've got an expert group here to be able to talk. We're gonna talk about some pretty important topics um, and then at the end of the conversation, we're going to have a question and answer at the end. So just hold your questions till the end. So um, I think what you're going to get out of this is you're going to be able to see um, how do you select an, an ideal project for XR? Um, how do you find a champion within your organization? How do you get the message out? How do you select the use case? How do you calculate an ROI? What should you be looking for? And what, sh what should you be looking for for a successful launch? And then there are some projects that, you know, might have been ideal candidates but never got funded or never got launched. We'll talk a little bit about that too. So I hope it's very informative. Okay, so um, how do we select an ideal project? There's a lot of different considerations. Susan, do you want to start us off and talk about your perspective? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. So, hello everybody. I'm, I'm uh, Susan Spark, the Learning Technology Manager at SLB. And so a lot of my um, conversation here today will be about the learning and training space and the applications of XR therein. And in this case, I'm going to talk about basically what is our pilot project, which was very much a big bang. Uh, it's quite old now. It was released in 2017. Uh, with the assistance of the University of Central Florida and their School for Simulation and Training. So this project really tackled some very rare training. So it happened primarily for offshore cementing on offshore rigs, uh, which is one of the main uh, processes that uh, SLB tackles. And we were having a few incidents. But it raised the question that I think all of you can probably answer right now. So if you have someone who has to do a temporary abandonment on a uh, offshore rig when a hurricane is coming, how do you train for that? That's not something where we can easily say, hey, you, go fly out there, there's a hurricane coming, right? So we have to have some alternatives. And that's one of the key questions to ask. What is a scenario where you can think, 
how would you train something like that? So this uh, particular experience has three rigs, goes through a number of different operations. It's taught in a two-week class, so it wasn't meant to be shorter, actually, than, than the standard class. But it allowed us to experience things that we actually can't do in any other way, right? I can take you anywhere in VR. So it met one big criteria, which is that this was a job that was very rare, it was very dangerous, it was very costly, it was very large scale. So some of those criteria make excellent choices for VR simulations. It allows our employees to fail in safe mode, and of course failing is a very good way to learn. Another aspect that was really core to the success of this project and continues again to this day, is that it was part of an overall learning modernization effort. So in addition to just going into simulation-based learning, it was part of looking at the overall learning ecosystem, the LMS, our entire approach to data in learning. And so this, again, tying it to a major corporate initiative allowed us to demonstrate that goal, that future use case example, and get buy-in for that. Another reason it was a great pilot and a great project that could be of benefit to people is that it really helped uh, address and kind of solidify our overall XR um, strategy. Meaning we realized that once we built out these rigs, we could reuse them, right? And so once we had an investment in some of the major pieces, we could reuse them over and over again. So someone said on the panel earlier, we just wanted a hole, and I'm like, well, we sell, dr <laughs> we sell drilling, great. Um, but we can reuse those sorts of examples of drilling repeatedly. So once we invested, we could reuse, and that was a big part of the success of this pilot. Thank you, Susan. John, what are some of the factors when you look at selecting an ideal project? Yeah, I think it's very similar to what uh, we're talking about. Uh, we work in construction, and, and safety is a very big uh, um, part of construction. So um, training somebody in situations uh, that are dangerous, uh, if we could do that in a virtual environment, uh, obviously it's a much better way to do that. If working at heights, give them the ideas of what it's like to work at heights in, in those types of environments. Uh, you know, as well as, as you know, picking up the, you know, the low-hanging fruit, I think, from, uh, you know, things to select uh, when you're looking for um, good projects, ones that have a big bang for your buck, things that um, are across the enterprise. Um, oftentimes in construction, uh, we work with building models, and so our low-hanging fruit is, is visualizing uh, the process of building uh, using those models. So it's a lot easier for us to, to get into that environment and get into uh, VR because we have that infrastructure already built. That's excellent. That's actually some really good advice. Thank you. So thinking about XR projects, okay, creating demos and finding and leveraging champions within your organization is incredibly important. We've all shipped um, worked on XR uh, related, if it's augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and being able to create a demo and show people what it is you intend to do is, is probably one of the most important things. Matthew, what do you look for when you're creating demo material, or how do you work on finding and leveraging champions within the organization? My name is Matt Leshko. I work for Transocean, so we are those drilling rigs that Susan was talking about, and I'm going to be finding her to get some of those assets. I'd like to reuse them. Um, I'd, also, <laughs> I'd also like to say that uh, I'm glad to be up here with the experts. They're, they're sitting down here. Last year, I was in your shoes sitting out there, so uh, next year, you could be up here. When it comes to the, the demos, I think... Um, it doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be involved, but it has to resonate with the end user. 
So they, they have to be able to understand what it is. So depending on your technological capabilities and, and if you have an IT background or you know how to code, then you can, you can do more, right? But you can also go and hire somebody on a temporary basis to build something small for you fairly cheaply. So, um, so identify something at a small scale that will resonate with them. And then two, depending on how technologically savvy you are, there's so many free products out there that you can leverage. Um, even just on the iPhone and the iPad with LiDAR that's built in now, you can go 3D scan anything. Um, varying ranges of quality, but um, you, you can literally scan anything. And then you have Unity, uh, you have Blender, so you can take those 3D assets and um, manipulate them in there. And then as far as finding champions, I think a lot of the conversation is always around the C-suite and the decision makers. But I, I think you have to start much lower than that. So you have to get the people excited first. And the number one way to do that is put them in a headset. You put that headset on, I always like to say that that's the sales pitch. I don't have to make one after they put that headset on because it, it's impressive. So um, start with the people and then find champions at a, a you know little bit higher level. So I have some of my champions here today in the, the first row from Norway. And uh, you know I went over there, I took a headset with me and um, then, put the headset on him, and then he started putting it on everybody there and uh, really you know, took, took over the, the product or the project and it's been, uh, been real great. That's, that's phenomenal. And, and Matthew, I think you hit on a point that we, that we all um, you know, aspire to and that is to get actual product and experience into the hands of people that are in your organization. Uh, I work in R&D, so I say uh, you have to believe it to see it. So that's at my stage, and then when it goes to product, you know, people need to see it, they need to experience it, and then they believe it. So at the very, very early phase, and I really caution these days against um, using you know, promotional after effects reels and special effect demos and what have you if it isn't grounded in a real experience. Because sometimes people can sense that a mile away, they need to put the headset on and experience it. So you've got to put all your effort and your energy, but that said, you have to promote what you're doing. So you need a video message, you need some sort of a channel of communication so that senior stakeholders, people in the C-suite, your colleagues or people on your teams, everybody's going to be aligned and know what you're trying to do. It's, uh, it's very, very important. It can't be missed because if it does, your initiative can get lost in the shuffle. And we definitely don't, we don't want that. Um, I know that you don't want that. So you have to be able to find a way to communicate. And then leveraging a champion, and I, I'm a firm believer myself of bottom up uh, instead of top down, so you get, you know, the, you get excitement. And the, it, one thing about our industry is the excitement's there, it's real. Uh, the trouble is we saw it in science fiction, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, you know, and now it's coming more real every year. Every year there's better hardware. Look at the new Snapdragon processor. You know, and the things that are coming. So there's the, the the technology is proving it out. But people saw it many years ago in science fiction, but now it's reality. Sort of like the iPad was on Star Trek in the 1980s. So, um, you know, not all projects are successful, and and some can die in the early stages. Um, some can be tested and vetted, and then ultimately, um, you know, and, and they do say that you learn you learn from your failures. So that sometimes a failure is just as good. Um, let's talk about projects maybe that did not get funded. So, um, Morali, I'm going to start with you. Um, maybe you have some insights on that. Um, sure. Just for the record, um, we do have some projects that have gotten funded. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is I'm not sitting here because I'm entirely terrible at that. <laughs> uh, so, my, so my name is Morali Nathan. I'm with Avery Dennison. And uh, I, I head up our uh, Digital Innovation Center of Excellence. Four or five years ago when we started this, um, when, when we started this team, our purpose was to um, be intentional about bringing technology into the company, right? So when we talk about technology, uh, today everything is technology, but there, there is, uh, we, we call it emerging technology, there are new ways of working, there are some changes that need to be made. Uh, we heard in the previous panel, cultural, the importance of addressing cultural change and so on. So that was, that was our mission. So we're a very, we're a small team. So if you put it that way, um, 
we, we introduce, uh, so, so first thing what we do is we learn this technology ourselves so that we can speak knowledgeably about it, right? So and then, then we go and put, have some, get some hands-on experience with it. So um, let, let me, I, I, wanna, I wanna like engage the audience a little bit, if that's okay. I am a DIY kind of person. Any DIYers in the crowd? Woo! Wow, I'm in good company. Wow, that's exciting. Okay, so you will understand and relate to me if I said that whether I bought a TV or a toaster, if there is a manual in the box, I will take it, I will read it, okay? And then I will save it somewhere because I would need it one day, someday, yes? How many of you say do that? Okay, how many of you, um, I mean, there's probably like many social media out there, TikTok is very famous, my wife loves TikTok, but she hates when I watch YouTube, but I go to YouTube, I watch a lot of DIY videos. I am a sucker for free learning and doing. How many of you are in the crowd like me? Awesome. Now, that is our enemy. Let me tell you why, okay? A handwritten manual is easy to create because we've been there, done that, right? Even a crappy one is, you know, if it's out there, somebody would use it, right? It's easy. We do that. Creating videos has become so much easier, right? So now we are competing with easy. We're competing with what works, not every time, but most of the times. Now we're talking about bringing technology into our company like augmented operation, okay? And then there is some comp there's some great benefits with it, uh, 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 for it, right? But there are also some challenges around it. How ready are we to handle this challenge? So now the first, I'm gonna talk about some success factors here and then I'll sum it up. So the first factor we're talking about here is the skill. How much do we know this technology? How much do we really understand it? To the point where, one, we can advocate for it and we can convert people into believers, right? So that is, that is the most th important thing. The second part of it is this technology is ever-changing. What you heard about uh, a particular headset or a particular piece of software three months ago is not the same today, right? And three months down the road, that's gonna be changing. So there is a constant need. It's not like a one and done thing. It's not like, oh, I read this, uh, stay, this SOP like five times, I memorize it, I know it, right? But, that, but with technology, that's not the case. We always have to be in the know, right? So skill, the know-how, and also how to go about working it, applying this to get the benefit, the desired outcome, that is, that is gonna be really key. So the first important thing is skill. The next important thing is the drill. What this means is, you're gonna probably hear from other speakers here too, is everybody would talk about uh, best practices, they would talk about having governance, they talk about having security, all of that is absolutely critical. Knowing the purpose, objectives and goals, right? And having a roadmap, having an execution plan, all of that is really important. I'm not gonna like talk about every little bit of thing, but that is what I call the drill. And teams that are really successful in adopting those things have a higher rate of getting projects funded in a company like ours. And the third is what I call the will, okay? Now, why is this important? This is unknown territory. There's a lot of uncertainty. And, and there's also gonna be adversity. There's gonna be a rejection. How many times have you started an initiative in AR, VR only for it to not get it's only for it to not even take off from the ground, right? So we will, somebody will need to, and, and um, Micah, you mentioned championship, right? It's, it's very important because somebody's got to be the sponsor. Somebody's gonna wanna say, look, you know, I wanna make a difference here, I wanna make a change, and we are gonna do this with AR, VR. If you don't have that champion who says, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to take that risk, this is the right thing to do, then projects don't get funded. So to summarize, here's what, here's what I'd say. Um, projects get funded when you have the will, when you have the skill, and when you have the drill. Otherwise, you cannot pay the bills, 
right? And your project is just going to stand still. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good one. Amanda, any, any thoughts from, uh, from your perspective at Volvo? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, hi everybody. I'm with Volvo and Mack Trucks. Um, I'm Amanda Clarita. I'm the Senior Manager for Learning Design and Development. So, um, if anybody would like to have a conversation on how to fail and fail forward, see me afterwards. I got a lot of stories. Um, but that being said, uh, I say fail forward because you should learn something every time you fail. Uh, try something it doesn't work but what are you going to do differently next time and that has been my experience um, over the past 10 years or so so absolutely agree with everything that um, that was shared so far and there's a lot of um, you know a lot of experience and challenges that'll come with applying these um, these solutions specifically for me it has to do with my audience and whether or not they're they're ready um, or willing you know, in the trucking industry, there's a there's a real variety of people. Uh, a lot of people have you know some great years of experience, 20, 30, 40 years working on trucks from 40 years ago. Um, the technology, even in the trucks, kind of throws people off a little bit. Much less when you introduce new technology that they have to use just to be able to work on the trucks that they thought they knew how to do. So um, that kind of adoption has been has been a little bit difficult for us, but you know, keep at it. That's <laughs> great, Amanda. Thank you. So just moving right along, folks. Um, we're going to talk a little bit now about use cases and ROI. Okay, ROI, the big, the big boogeyman, very important. Um, Morali, do you want to talk to us about use cases and ROI? Sure. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun topic. And I think one of the biggest challenges I've ever had is to really understand what ROI meant, right? The ROI means so many different things to so many different people. But ultimately, you have to appeal to the finance gods, right? Because everything has to go through that muster. And there is a need for, oh, oh, by the way, how many of you are in IT? Okay, don't be scared. I'm also in <laughs> IT. All right. How many of you are part of the business but not finance? Like it could be manufacturing, okay, it could be production, it could be, okay, awesome. How many of you are in finance? Awesome. <laughs> Meaning, I just don't want it to be a lecture for a financial lecture for a financial guru here, that's all, right? So um, ROI, and, and here's the thing, this is, this is what I, I really try to understand. Um, it, it, it's a very simple math, right? You know, money goes in and money comes out, right? Now, when money comes out, is it on the negative or is it on the positive? Simple, right? You, you, you spend money, you, you add value to your product, you sell it, you make profit. Right? But in the finance world, this equation is actually seen very differently. And, and I'm, I'm sharing this to be with you in all transparency because this actually works. Right? It's not about, you know, if I want to lead a project, if I want to put a business case together, if I'm leading it, no problem. I'll do it. Right? I'm not trying to sound cocky, but I've done it before so I can do it. But the thing is, I'm in a position where I have to enable you or the business people to be able to meet that financial requirement. There are soft benefits. We, we hear this term many times. There are soft benefits and hard benefits. Hard benefits is what we call tangibles. So one of the biggest ch challenges is uh, to, to really be able to address and tell them, here are the soft benefits. This is what soft benefits are. These are what are hard benefits. No matter how much productivity we say that our technology, our solutions are going to provide, how transformational it's going to be, if we are not able to capture the incremental gains in a way that appeals to those finance gods, our projects don't get funded. Okay? So the return on investment is essentially a measure of how much money you're putting in, whether it is capital or expense, right? We absolutely need to know that. One of the most important things is, and, and this, this I've, I've seen his work, um, you know, a, a small team came to us and said, hey, we wanna get started, we wanna like explore this technology. We said, great, wow, do you have a use case? No, we don't have a use case. How do we get started? 
So the thing is, they said, how many, so first I asked them, how many people do you want to involve in this? Five people, so roughly five headsets. Do the math, right? Whatever brand of headsets you're gonna get. Now these assets, these are assets, which means that's capital spend. Now, of course, you know, you need to have allocations for your capital spend, but capital, the good thing about capital is it can be amortized over five years or depending on your company's policy for how many ever years, which means you are, your company is not going to incur the full spend in, 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 in the same year. Moreover, you can also amortize it, right? Now, that is the benefit that we will actually get, and that's how we can get started really fast. Now, then comes the question of how do we go about if, you know how do we go about experimenting with this now there are some costs that will be spent but then if you have a small team that is already an expert like my team we, we dabble with this technology right so we can actually educate them we can train them we have great partners in our network they will come and educate us so we can get that type of education that exposure that demonstration you know, we have some partners, they have an innovation lab. We take them to that innovation lab. So these are all costs that we can actually avoid, right? Now, Morali, yeah. I see Susan shaking, uh, oh, nodding her head, I'm yes. Sorry. How about from your perspective? Just, just give other people all the time. Yeah, yeah, um, so actually I'm gonna continue the interaction. Uh, so how many of you are in training, learning, development? Okay, yay, hello everybody. Uh, so, you have your e-learning catalogs, you got that leadership training that you invested in. What's the ROI on any of your courses? Exactly. Yeah, so here's the problem. This is a problem of L&D, and, and of course that's my bias in this, in this particular audience, where we're only measuring attendance, the room was cold, I didn't like the lunch, the instructor was nice, but he's standing right here, so I'm going to say yes. We don't look at data enough to really understand the impact, we just kind of create it. So this ROI question in XR is a much wider question that you have to apply in L&D, right? So of, of what your use cases are, what data you're collecting, there are ways to do this right uh, and ways to do it like we traditionally do it, which is wrong. The other thing I would just say in terms of use cases, man, your employees have all sorts of use cases. So even when I was coming up on the elevator, somebody said, man, we need an AR app to find out where all the rooms are. So do some design thinking sessions, do some hackathons, throw some ideas out there, solicit, you'll have plenty. It's gonna be about deciding from that point on, I guarantee. That's excellent, thank you. Okay, moving on, guys. Um, what are some of the, what are the steps to a successful XR launch, John? What do you think? What do you think are the criticals? Well, I had uh, really enjoyed the conversations earlier when we were talking about failure, you know, and uh, now we're talking about success, right? But uh, you can't have success, success without the failure, and really, you know, some of the steps to get there involve learning. And um, at Kiwit, uh, I'm part of the innovation team at Kiwit, and so we do a lot of proof of concepts. So we will spend a lot of time doing really quick proof of concepts with the people that are gonna be using the technology so that we can get them involved and learn from them. I think we talked about you know, failing forward and uh, uh, we do that quite a bit. So it's really understanding, getting the technology in the hands of the people and understanding the people processes and systems that affect the launch. And I got a real quick example of failure that uh, turns into success, I think. Uh, so at Kiwit, uh, uh, most of our technology involves buildings, and we use building models to uh, visualize uh, what our work is. Now we can take that uh, in AR and go directly from CAD to um, an XR platform pretty easily. There's lots of really good uh, software packages out there that can do that. Um, and the sales guys will show you a, a beach house for some reason, it's always a beach house. Um, and it's real simple. They, go, they click a button and it goes from uh, CAD to, to, to the goggles and everybody's amazed, they're on the beach, enjoying it. Well, that's great if you build beach houses. Um, Kiwit builds really big things. Multi-billion dollar factories, refineries, um, acres and acres of, of really complex things. So our CAD models 
Um, when you put them in those same systems, they don't go into the VR. They will die. Um, so then you have to have some expertise on your end to then say, okay, let's make the CAD simpler. And either removing part of the CAD or removing some of the layers. Um, and so we put that application out in the field. The people in the field don't have CAD experience. They just want to use the VR. So that POC failed because, not because of the system, but because of the people in the process. We didn't have the people in the process to work with the CAD. Now out of that came uh, another application that we just happened to be testing uh, that was able to ingest whatever size CAD file we wanted. And we were able to give that to the same people in the field they didn't have to worry about learning CAD, they didn't have to worry about making things simpler, um, and they were able to use it very successfully without having to worry about a lot of the processes and systems ahead of that. Now, John, you mentioned what could have been potentially a project killer. So you, you found a technology that, that got where you wanted to go. Uh, I wanted to ask Amanda, uh, you know, in your experience, what are, some of the, what are some of the top things that you worry, wonder about, or see that could be Think that it could be a threat. Yeah, great question. Um, I have several. I have a list, um, but it's so timely that that John was talking about CAD because, of course, when you're building trucks, we've got CAD drawings as well. Um, for every nut and bolt that is inside of that vehicle, and there's thousands of them. Um, there's also quite a few file types of CAD, which I didn't know. You know, when you start out, CAD is just CAD. I don't know what that means. Well, I know it means computer aided drafting, but you know. There's, I, I did a quick search on Google. There was like 58 different file types for CAD, and I know that that's not an ex, you know, a complete list. But not knowing what your vendor needs, not knowing what you have, not knowing if they can work with what you have, or how long it would take them to update and edit your files into a manner that works for them before they even start working on your actual project can cause delays in your development time, um, can cause increases to your cost. So um, that's definitely something, if you're working with CAD, if you're gonna use CAD, it's great. It gives you a lot of detail, a lot of layers, a lot of, you know, a lot of creativity, but, um, you know, you, you need to know what you're working with first. What can you offer and then find yourself a partner that actually, excuse me, can use that appropriately. Um, timelines. Everybody wants what they want as quickly as possible, right? And I have definitely learned that specifically with VR and AR, especially with the, the constant moving of this technology, you're not gonna get your solution tomorrow. It just, it's not gonna happen. Especially if you want something that is, you know, a quality deliverable that looks good, that feels good, that does what it's supposed to do. So for me, you know, our end result is that you should learn something when you complete the experience, or you should have been able to practice something to a level of proficiency. And if that doesn't happen, it doesn't matter how pretty the truck looks, you know, it's a failure. So um, be realistic with your timelines, not considering other solutions. There are self-authoring tools that are available now that you know, don't need CAD. Scenario VR, for instance, you can use 3D video, 3D images, um, and you can create something that is user-friendly, that is quicker to market, that is scalable. You can render a SCORM from there um, and load that to your LMS, so that's a good option. Consider smaller scale first as an option yeah. and then build. Um, and then lastly, just, you know, we had the, the conversation earlier that was mentioned about um, um, scaling and being able to offer to a large, wide audience. Um, just ensuring that your audience, again, is ready for that. Do they have head, headgear? Do they want to make an investment? Do you need to buy them all? Um, what is that going to look like for your organization is something that you have to consider before you decide that this is what you're going to do. Um, and tracking, tracking your training packages and things like that. For me, anyway, depending on what 
you know, do you want to know? Do you want data? Do you want reporting? Do you want tracking? You know, do you want to know if somebody completed this at 80% or 95%? If that's something that you're concerned with, especially from a training and development perspective, then you have to consider your delivery method also and whether or not you can pull out those types of metrics from that tool. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, so listen, um, we're in a round robin now. So we've got one minute each. Matt, we're going to start with you. Um, with what you know now, what singular piece of advice would you give the audience today so that their uh, XR project might be successful? Yeah, um, I, I could talk a whole panel about that. Um, so I'm fairly new to the, the game, right? And I have maybe 10 headsets throughout the company. and, and they haven't made it to the end user yet. We're still in that proof of concept phase. Um, we've rolled out some, some tours. Um, so I'm gonna talk more about what you can do here at this conference um, to, to make it successful. Um, talk to people. If you're not a social person, the people sitting around you are just like you. They like this stuff, they wanna talk about it. Uh, Susan and I, our offices happen to be next to each other and uh, we sat down and it was like a 30 minute conversation planned and it lasted like two and a half hours because we just didn't stop talking. Um, so network, just get out of your shell. And then two, don't be afraid to put on the headsets. We all look silly when we do it, but if you don't try them out, you won't know which ones will work for you. So you put on the headsets, it. go talk to the vendors. Um, that's what, what they're there for. Thank you, John, you're up. Yeah, and I'll kind of add on to that. So. I, um, I've been doing the XR space for about seven years, and so I've put headsets on probably a couple thousand people, uh, anywhere from kindergarten age kids to uh, really old construction dudes. Um, and, and one of the things that you know about looking silly is, is uh, that you learn is, is people are very self-conscious about the technology. Um, I guarantee if I brought somebody up on stage and put the a VR goggle on them, they probably last maybe a minute before they want to take it off and um, you can't get very good feedback from that. So what we learned is when we're doing demos and we're trying to get feedback from people, put them in a separate room, get us have a safe area for them to where their, you know, their uh, coworkers aren't taking pictures of them and making fun of them and uh, they'll last maybe 15 minutes uh, and give you much better feedback. Uh, otherwise, they'll put it on and they'll, and they'll give you feedback of it was good. Yeah. So uh, that's a much better way to do it. We see that in our pilots as well. That's a, that's a critical one. That's the human factors, right? Susan, how about you? Yeah, so my, my go-to answer on this is about IT, but there's a lot of IT folks here on my path out the door, so maybe I'll back that off. Thank you for being here. We love you. Uh, please, please help evangelize the technology. Uh, but to echo in large part what others are saying about being here, uh, one of the things that's common to do is that if you're in training, you go to training talks and you go to training vendors. And if you're in some other part, you, you focus on that. But you're going to hear here, there, and everywhere about things like digital twins and the industrial metaverse and AI and robotics and drones. And you may think, that's not for me. Like, I don't need to know about that. Here's the, the truth. These are at least adjacent technologies. They're really enabling technologies, mutually enabling technologies, and they're all converging. So don't make the mistake of thinking I'm in my little silo. Look at what everybody's offering. Think about how could I use this? You could have a digital twin for training. There's no reason not to. So keep a broad perspective and then take that back to your organization and start talking to people internally who have that digital twin and other aspects as well. That's how you suddenly have an XR roadmap when you didn't think you had one before. That's excellent, thank you. Morelli, how about you? Sure, um, uh, excellent, excellent uh, points. I, I have plenty to say, but for sake of time, I'll try to keep this to like two or three, if that's okay. Uh, I just need permission to do that. So first thing is, uh, thank you. <laughs> first, first thing is, don't feel the pressure. I think we, we all have a job to do and we all, some of us have mandates and 
some of us have, this could be our mission to bring in this type of technology, get it implemented. So just don't feel the time pressure at all because I think you need to give yourself enough time to learn uh, yourself. Then ask yourself, are you a believer? Because if you believe in this, what are the steps that you took to become a believer? Because if you are actually providing this as a solution to a business partner of yours, then they're probably gonna wanna go through the same steps as well. So just repeat those steps. It becomes exactly. so much easier for you to reproduce that, to, to convert people into believers, right? And the third is, um, I forgot, uh, but the, um, the, the, the third most important thing is know uh, who is driving this. Because the thing is, you might have your idea, you might say, wow, this is gonna work, you might have all of that creativity and all of this, but if you are not the person responsible for championing this end solution, and if you are not the person championing the business case, then figure out a way to partner with them so that your idea becomes their idea. And your vision becomes their vision. It is a ruthless game. Let me tell you this, okay? I mean, always ask the question, what is in it for you? What is in it for the company? And what is it that we are working for? The outcomes are always far more beneficial than individual and personal gains, right? I mean, I'm not telling you just be altruistic and just give away free work. No, that's not what I'm saying. But realistically speaking, if you know the audience well, figure out who is driving this and that person needs to become that buyer, right? So these are the three things that I have really seen as very, very critical in being able to influence the adoption of this particular technology and the concept and the value proposition. Thank you very much. And Amanda, just to, do you have a final thought on, uh, on one thing you could say? Sure. Um, you know, I, just for anybody out there who's just, you know, just getting started and you're, do I want to do this? If you really want to do it, just do it. Um, you know, like Murali said, be ready to learn. You're going to learn, okay? Prepare for your failures, but make sure you fail forward because you'll have another iteration. You'll have another chance. You'll get the time to do it differently, to do it better, and eventually you will succeed. And if, if you have the question, somebody else has already asked it. So I, I wouldn't be up here if it wasn't for the people I literally met last year. We got into a group. Every time I have a question, I go to them. There's podcasts, XR at Work podcast is a, a great one. Yeah. Um, the information's out there. It really is. Thank you. Thank you, Matt and Amanda. So, so listen, folks, uh, we just got a couple minutes. We started two minutes late, so uh, we've got a couple minutes here for questions. So if anybody would like to ask any questions, the, the panel will be delighted to answer. Hi, uh, Laura Kinkle with Daimler Trucks. Um, so we've had a lot of successful proof of concepts, but I'm wondering about your approach of whether you skill up internally with developers or whether you go to vendors who could develop them themselves um, as a service. Could I, yeah. could I answer that? Or? Yeah. Uh, so that is an excellent question, and I think there may not even be one answer for everything. It may depend a little bit on the various scopes of the project and your skill set. We, for the most part, decided to internalize that capability for three reasons. The first one is that we design and manufacture a lot of our own tools and equipment, which means that we already have a lot of the assets coming through the pipeline. So we need to reuse a lot of those uh, for this purpose. The next reason is that we develop a lot of software, so a lot of the software practices were in place as well. And the final reason is that a lot of that software contains simulation engines in it, which when you, all you have to do, it's very easy. My innovation manager is right here and he's like, no, stop it. <laughs> all you have to do is just plug those three things together and voila, you've got the great simulation. But we have used some third parties as well and certainly we use, again, uh, University of Central Florida as a consultant on um, the human factors part of <clears throat> developing simulations. So, so we're at time here. I don't know if we have a couple extra minutes for any additional questions. And this gentleman has a question. Do we have two more minutes? 
One more? Yep. Okay. Uh, Kit Lance Benoit with ACO. I'm curious, you guys keep mentioning fail forward, which I think is a great concept, but how do you manage change fatigue with your failures and the end user? Like, there's only so many times I think we can fail before we're going to lose the attention of these, some of these people. So I'm, I'm curious how you guys manage that. So, um, just one thing, well, one of the biggest things for, for us is piloting. Um, you know, you're, you have to test your solution. You have to know, is this going to work? And, and am I going to be able to scale this across the board? So for us, piloting is really, really important. Um, but especially for, for training and development, we have to ensure that our pilot includes our primary audience. You know, it's not a show and tell, like, hey, look what I built. You really need to pilot with, with an audience of, of the people that you expect to use your solution on a regular basis to get the you know, some true data and responses in terms of whether this is going to work or not. And then you have to be ready to iterate, right? Something might not feel right. Some piece may not work right. Uh, we may not represent the product correctly. So you have to be ready to iterate. Um, and maybe that's rotating members of your team, you know, to your point, you talk about fatigue and things like that. Um, maybe it's rotating members of your team, maybe it's rotating um, activities and responsibilities, maybe it's running several different pilots at one time um, to gather as much data as you can to move forward. But I, I really think piloting is one of the best ways that you can um, be as successful as early as, as possible. Yeah, I think i add to that as well is, you know, we do a lot of proof of concepts uh, in the innovation team, and, and it's really about selecting your audience and getting people that are leaning forward into things already, uh, which really helps them stay excited, getting interaction from them. And I think those type of people, once they see that the feedback they're giving to us that we're actioning on them, and it, it feeds them as well. So that keeps them energized and, and part of the pilot and part of the proof of concept. And good use cases. Yeah, I'll just add to that one quick thing. So what we, this is something that worked um, in one of our manufacturing plants and factories is when we launched uh, the technology, we did a proof of concept, um, we engaged the audience, we're very, very interactive, we engaged, we deployed it, and then we flipped and turned the ownership of that particular technology and the solution to them. So now it is up to so them to drive the change. Yeah. So if the change is driven from you, if you are external, then there's change, there's, the change fatigue is felt. I mean, the change fatigue is gonna exist. It, it's not gonna disappear, right? But it's a psychological effect. If you are driving the change, your team is driving the change for your own good, then it is more accepted and people complain less. So we, that, te that technique worked, that, that tactic worked yeah. for one location. Don't try to hold on to everything. If you, if you love it enough, let it go. You know, others will take. Listen, we're out of time, guys. We, we love it. So if anyone had any additional questions, we'll be around a little bit. But I think we've got to leave the stage and get ready for the next. Get off. you got to get off. Okay. Just kidding. That was great. Thank you. Thank you all.